Hey everyone, it's Lance with Christianity Minute. Well, unless you've been living out in the wilderness off nothing but locusts and wild honey, you're probably well aware that there's an illness that's sweeping the globe. Now, I'm not going to name it here for fear that YouTube's algorithm killing this video, but I think we all know what I'm talking about. This illness has caused many governments to shut down travel or put people under requirements to stay at home and avoid groups of people. You know, this puts Christians in sticky situations. So, does the Bible give us any guidance on how to move forward? First, let's talk about this illness for a second. I'm hearing through social media that many believe that it's some kind of hoax or that it's really not that bad. Now, I'm not a doctor, but the CDC has said that the symptoms are like a, a mild to moderate case of the flu. So if you're healthy, you're likely not to die from the virus. It's the elderly, the sick, and the immune compromised who are in very real danger. So this is why everyone's freaking out about this thing, and governments are shutting down schools and events and jobs and life in general. This thing jumps from person to person like wildfire. While if I were to get it, I'd probably be pretty miserable for about a week or so. If my wife's grandmother were to get it by coming in contact with someone who had it, it could kill her. Okay, so I'm not sick. I can go, right? Apparently, from what I understand from the CDC and from other sources, you can get it and be asymptomatic for up to two weeks before you actually know that you're sick. How many people can you infect in two weeks? How many people are you around in a two-week time span? Personally, that could be hundreds of people. I, I work in a school. So I risk my kids and the other faculty. I could risk the people at stores that I visit. I could risk the parents that I have to deal with. I can risk my neighbors as I ask them about their latest barbecue competition. And I risk folks at church whom I'm going to hug and shake hands with as we come together for fellowship. Once they're infected, how many people do you think they can then infect in two weeks? Then those people. Now, how that translates to people buying ridiculous amounts of toilet paper? I haven't figured that one out yet. Okay, so we've established that we shouldn't get out and interact with folks unless we have no choice. But what about church, though? Let's read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have the confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Okay, so we need to meet Paul says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, mind you, not to forsake the assembly. Well, when do we meet? Well, it's on his resurrection day, which was, according to Mark 16, 9, the first day of the week, or Sunday. We see examples in the New Testament of contemporary Christians doing this in places such as Acts 20 and 7, where they're meeting together, quote-unquote, to break bread. The language indicates that this was a Lord's Supper, not a common meal. We also see Paul giving a speech, which we'd call it a sermon today, around midnight on what we would call Saturday night going into Sunday morning. Remember that the Jews put the start of the day at sunset, 6 p.m.-ish, not midnight like we do now. Okay, great. So we have to go to assembly to be pleasing to God. Well, President Trump, and now the governor of my state, is telling us no assemblies of more than 10 folks. And there are some parts of the world that are not allowing assembling at all, such as the Philippines. We as Christians need to be compliant 
with the government. I brought up this verse in my video about whether Christians should pay taxes or not. Be sure to check out that video from last year's Sunday before April 15th. It's Romans 13 verses 1 through 7. It reads, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjugation, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes." For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all that is owed to them, taxes on whom taxes are owed, revenue on whom revenue is owed, respect on whom respect is owed, honor on whom honor is owed. Okay, so by God's command, we are to obey the government. And by God's command, we are supposed to assemble. So, if by God's command, we are to obey the government... And by God's command, we're supposed to assemble, but the government isn't, isn't letting us assemble. How can we be right? All right. Jesus mentioned in Matthew 6, 24, that you can't serve two opposing masters. Who is Jesus saying we should serve first then? Well, it's God, of course. He continues a few verses later in Matthew 6, 33, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If the government tells you not to assemble, you know what you should do? You should assemble anyway. Oh, wait, 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 what? Are you saying we should defy the government? Okay, let's take a second. How can we assemble without breaking the commands of the government? So many have their hearts set that assembling can only take place in a particular building. What is the church, after all? Acts 20.28 20, tells us that the church was purchased by the blood of Christ. And did Jesus buy a building? No, he bought souls. You and I, we are the church. And if we assemble, even in small groups, possibly even as families... Matthew 18.20 says it only takes two or three gathered together in his name to constitute assembly. I remember a few years ago, um, my family went down to Hawaii for vacation. Uh, we had a wonderful time, but we couldn't find a sound church on the entire island of Maui. So, what were we to do? Well, we headed to the supermarket. We picked up some fruit of the vine and some unleavened bread. And Sunday, we came together around the kitchen table of our suite. We had a prayer. We sang songs. We partook of the memorial of Jesus' death and had a Bible study. It was a quiet time in service to God. Now, it didn't last long, but we even dressed up a little nicer for the occasion because the Lord was going to be among us as we offered worship to Him. Even while on vacation, far away from our little congregation building, we knew we couldn't neglect worship to God. To do so would be sinful. Now, remember, this virus is real, and it can be very dangerous. So please, practice social distancing. Wash your hands. I know that while at Assembly Wednesday night, I had to keep my hands in my pockets in order not to shake hands. I really had to fight the urge to hug several people, which I usually do. Our congregation has even decided to go down to one service a week, Sunday morning, to minimize exposure. We're fortunate enough that we can still assemble at our building currently. If the time comes that we're commanded not to, though, we will still assemble. We may wear special masks. <laughs> we may pass out individual sanitary containers of unleavened bread so that nobody has to touch anyone else's. 
We may have several services of 10 people or less. We may have to assemble in small groups in homes. We may even have to Lysol everything when we're done. But the point is that we still will assemble and worship God, even in the midst of a crisis. Now, if any of my Filipino or Italian brethren are watching, I'm going to tell you right now, stay strong and be safe. Of course, if you're sick, stay home. Staying home because you're deathly ill or know that you might infect others to make them deathly ill is not the same as a forsaking the assembly. We need to love our brethren and care for them too. If you think you've come in contact with anyone who's contracted the virus, stay home and please, if you can, get tested. We need to try to curb the spread of this thing as much as possible. But God still needs to be at the front of our minds, as always. Keep the faith, my dear friends. Remember what 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 through 18 says. It says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen, those are eternal. With that, I hope the rest of your day goes very well. Let me ask you a question real quick. How do you feel about online fellowship? Now, I'm not talking about a pre-recorded session like this one, but a live option where everyone could communicate with one another in some way. And the Lord's Supper is taken at a specified time with unleavened bread and few of the fruit of the vine at each location. I want your thoughts in the comments section below. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Feel free to share any part of this video, and if you'd like to donate, there are links in the video's description. If you'd like to keep learning more, check out some of my other videos on your screen, and I will see you next time right here on Christianity Minute.